Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dean Lees from the engineering and marketing team here at Buckley Associates. Uh, before we start the webinar here, I'd just like to say a few words. Uh, first, thank you to everyone that is on the line participating today. We, uh, we really appreciate you taking some time out of your day to, to learn about uh, air distribution for ORs and uh, also other spaces within patient care facilities. Um, it really means a lot to us that you've joined us on the phone here today um, and virtually. A lot of effort has gone into the planning of these webinars and, and, and uh, you know, the Buckley team, we, we take the amount of people that sign up for these as a sign that people see the value in the service we're providing here. And, uh, you know, we hope that's true for, for you guys here on today. Um, we really take a lot of pride in providing uh, educational opportunities to the engineering uh, contractor community within the Northeast, even during these times. And, and I'm really proud that we've been able to find a way to do this virtually and uh, continue educating the community. Uh, Chris Geeson is on the phone here today. He's gonna be presenting uh, and talking to you all. He has been at Price for 15 years. Um, he has a great wealth of knowledge on the systems that we're going to be talking about today. And, uh, you know, those systems are all relative to patient care facilities. There's going to be a heavy focus on operating rooms. And, um, you know, between Buckley and Price, I really do feel that we have a great amount of knowledge on these systems. And I'm really excited to share that with you all. Um, and uh, you know, it, it takes a lot to integrate these ceiling systems into the into hospitals, and uh, there's a lot that goes into them. And um, you know, Chris is going to talk about all the things that we need to consider when looking at a pre-engineered ceiling system for for an OR ceiling. Um, beyond that, one thing I do want to touch on as well is. Uh, the engineering support that we're able to provide on these systems. When you're talking about hospitals, whether it be patient rooms or OR ceiling systems, uh, there's a lot of clients that may be doing something a little new. Maybe the engineering team is looking at a different approach than what would traditionally be done. And uh, that's where Buckley and Price really shine. We're able to provide full engineering support early on uh, through Price's Research Center North up in Winnipeg. Um, if you're looking at an OR ceiling system and you have concerns about laminar flow across the table, if there's different air flow conditions than what you'd normally have, we can actually provide and we have on multiple projects. Uh, over the past few years myself, I've been um, involved in a lot of different mock-ups where we actually take your space and if there's a specific design consideration that is making the team a little nervous, making the client a little nervous, we can actually perform CFD analysis on it. We can perform a real world mock-up and uh, you know, take measurements, look at the design, look at how the airflow is within the space. Uh, if it's a patient room, we can determine the level of comfort that's going to be uh, experienced within that space. There's a lot that we can do through that Price Research Center North. And uh, it's a great resource to Buckley. The, the lab team at Price is incredible. And if you have uh, specific projects where you have certain concerns, please engage us early in the process. Um, Buckley has 10 mechanical engineers on staff that can support these type of projects. And, you know, we're here to help the Northeast market when it comes to, to these type of projects and, and honestly, all of Buckley's engineered products. Um, so if you have any applications that you're uh, needing help on, please let us know. Uh, reach out to myself, reach out to Sherry Malone. If you don't know who your Buckley contact is for engineering support, she can help you and point you in the direction of the right person. And, uh, and we'd be happy to help you. Um, 
couple of housekeeping things before we get going. There's a lot of people on the line here. Uh, there may be more joining throughout the presentation. We're going to keep everyone on mute, uh, but if you look in the upper right hand corner, there's a little chat bubble. If you have any questions that pop up during the presentation, uh, I'm going to be monitoring those while Chris is talking and uh, we can, you know, address those either as Chris is presenting or we'll address them at the end. Um, we'll kind of look at it on a case by case basis. Uh, this webinar is eligible for PDH credits. Um, if you need those, please reach out to myself or Sherry. We'll be sure to get those to you. Uh, and I think that's about all I have to say here. So I'll pass it over to Chris um, and let him start the presentation. Thank you again uh, from all of us at Buckley for joining. This is really something we're very proud of. And uh, thank you, Chris, for, for presenting for us. Thanks, Dean. Welcome, everybody. So our agenda for this presentation is we're going to start with some of the importance of the air distribution system and then some of the requirements that go behind the selection of the products and uses we're going to have in the space. We're going to then move into some of the modern operating room challenges, so some things we see nowadays as challenges that may not have been present in the past. We'll look at some strategies to those challenges as well as fully integrated operating room systems. After that, we'll talk about some other spaces outside of the OR. We'll talk about regular patient spaces, isolation room spaces, as well as what we call pandemic ready patient spaces. So what is the importance of the air distribution system? Well, in 2010, there was an estimated 16 million operative procedures that were performed. So the CDC reviewed these procedures and then they found that there was an associated 157,500 surgical site infections that were associated with those inpatient surgeries. So this is an issue. Not only does this cost the hospital money, uh, it can re result in extended stays at the hospital, uh, additional procedures that need to be performed, but there's also an associated mortality rate of 3% with these surgical site infections. So we want to try and minimize this as much as possible. And they say that while advances have been made in infection control practices, includes improved operating room ventilation. They talk about sterilization methods, barriers, surgical techniques, et cetera. But again, this is the CDC and they have improved operating room ventilation listed as their number one thing in to help control these uh, infections. So we want to focus and make sure we're doing the best we can to prevent the spread. So what we use to follow as a guideline for design for these spaces is ASHRAE standard 170. So this is the ventilation of healthcare facilities. This standard is widely adopted across all of North America. Some local regions may have uh, some minor tweaks to, to them, but in general, this is the standard that governs as a guideline for all facilities in North America. FGI or the Facility Guidelines Institute essentially just references ASHRAE 170 or has a direct copy from ASHRAE 170 for the HVAC related portions of these spaces. So what does ASHRAE tell us we need to do? First, it indicates to us the type of diffusers we're gonna have in the space. So we can see table 6.7.2, it says that the primary air outlet classifications, primary supply diffusers shall be group E non-aspirating and then any additional supply diffusers can be group E. So essentially, ASHRAE had broken down the types of diffusers into five categories, A through E, and then group E is a ceiling mounted diffuser with downward vertical projection. And then non-aspirating is a special subsection of that group where the airflow has to be unidirectional downwards and then traveling at a lower velocity. So point A kind of goes into a little more detail about that. It says the airflow shall be unidirectional downwards and the average velocity of the diffusers shall be 25 to 35 CFM per square foot. So this velocity range is determined based on several studies. And then they found that at traveling 25 CFM per square foot, the air is moving fast enough that it's able to displace contaminants inside the space as well as overcome any thermal plumes generated by the operating staff or the patients. But it's still moving slow enough when we restrict it to 35 CFM per square foot so that we're not going to be creating turbulence, we're not going to be entraining outside contaminants into our airstream. 
because we only want the clean filtered airflow to be what travels over top of the patient that has the open incisions. They also indicate to us the amount of coverage that we need, like where we need to locate our diffusers. So it says the area of the primary supply diffuser array shall extend a minimum of 12 inches beyond the footprint of the surgical table on each side. No more than 30% of the primary supply diffuser array shall be used for non-diffusers. So essentially we're taking a table, for example, maybe we have a six foot by two foot table. We have to add a one foot perimeter all along the outside of that. So now it becomes an eight foot by four foot area. Of this area, 70% of it, or it says 30% can be used for non-diffusers, which means 70% of it has to be supply diffusers. So that kind of tells us where we need to locate them and how we have to position them within the space. It also indicates to us the uh, type of pressurization. So we need to have positive pressure environment with a minimum of 0 0.01 inches. We have to have a minimum of 20 air changes per hour in the space. Four of those air changes have to be outdoor air and a typically a relative humidity between 20 and 60%. They also talk about the filtration requirements. So we have to have two levels of filtration in our airflow before it hits the operating space. The first one needs to be upstream of any coils and has to be a minimum of a MERV-7. This is typically like a pre-filter on your air handling unit, something along those lines. And then you need a secondary filter bank that needs to be downstream of any wet coils and fans and has to be a minimum of a MERV-14. Quite often, HEPA filters are also used as terminal filters for these applications, but the standard currently has the minimum as a MERV-14. Final thing I'll touch on regarding the ASHRAE standards is that the ability for the products to be cleanable is very important for the application. So it says surfaces of air distribution devices shall be suitable for cleaning and that these devices shall be designed and installed to allow for internal cleaning. So we need to be able to remove the face of the units, gain access to the interior, ensure that we're able to fully sterilize and clean the product that we put into these spaces. So there's two main design styles that are used in this type of space. The first one is a full laminar flow array system. This can be done with either individual laminar flow diffusers, a common plenum system, or an integrated system. We'll touch on all those as we go through this. And then the other is using an air curtain system. So for a laminar flow system, Essentially what we're doing in this design is we need to meet that 70% table coverage we talked about under ASHRAE. However, if we have additional airflow we need to supply to the space to meet our air change rate requirement, we just add on additional laminar flow diffusers, increase the area of that laminar flow array until we have enough diffusers that we can supply the total required airflow to that zone. So we're essentially creating a large zone of clean air directly over top of where our patient's gonna be located. And then we're gonna have low level returns in the space that's gonna be exhausting that airflow out of the space. So here's a quick little video here showing what the laminar airflow pattern looks like. It's very uh, slow moving airflow centered over top of the table, washing over top of that patient and as well as the nursing staff or doctors in that zone. So if we take a look above the ceiling here, this would probably be a fairly large space just due to the number of diffusers shown here. But the idea remains the same, that we're gonna have those diffusers centered over top of the table. We're gonna have to have a light ring perimeter along the outside of that to provide illumination to the space. We're gonna have to have panels in there that allow either access above the ceiling or for penetrations, for sprinklers, uh, equipment booms, med gas lines, anything of that sort. And then quite often there'll be a hard ceiling uh, that goes to the perimeter of the space. So some of the benefits of using a laminar airflow design is that it's a very widely accepted design. So there's been tons of supporting research. This type of design has been around for uh, a long period of time. So it's been tested, it's been uh, tried and true, so to speak. So it does have a slightly larger footprint because we are adding on additional diffusers in order to meet our air change rate requirement. However, that can be beneficial in a lot of spaces as well. 
for example, if you have a table that is able to rotate or move within that space, we still wanna be able to ensure we're getting that 70% coverage. So having a larger footprint helps us meet those requirements. And it does allow us to have the option for integrated HEPA filters. So we can have those terminal room side HEPA filters installed directly into the laminar flow diffusers. So speaking of HEPA filters installed into those diffusers, how these work is they use what's called a room side replaceable gel seal design. So on the plenum housing itself, they have what is called a knife edge, it's essentially a flanged portion of the plenum housing. And then on the filter, it has a channel that's filled with gel as we can see in the image on the bottom left hand side there. So this gel or the knife edge on the plenum basically penetrates into that gel when we install the filter that gel seals around that knife edge, and then that prevents any air from bypassing our filter, making sure that all the air is getting cleaned before it enters into the space. So some of the reasons people have started kind of shifting towards these room side replaceable HEPA filters versus doing a duct or a filter branch in the ductwork is that it can eliminate some concerns of any upstream duct cleanliness. For example, if you have your filter bank directly after your VAV system or your fan coil, and then that splits off into multiple branches to feed maybe a couple different operating spaces. The issue is if there's any sources of contaminant in that ductwork after it passes that filter, we have nothing cleaning that airflow before it hits the operating room. Whereas with the room side filters, we know that as soon as that air passes through the filter, it's going directly into our space. So we don't have any concerns that it can be picking up contaminants along the way. It does also lead to a slightly lower pressure drop on your overall system because you're spreading that filter area out over a larger area. You don't have as much high airflow passing through each one of these filters, which creates a lower pressure drop on your air handler. So air curtain systems, on the other hand, they do a slightly different design. We still need to maintain that 70% table coverage. So irrelevant of what system design we're using, that AFRI requirement for that 70% table coverage still needs to be met. The difference is, is after we've already met that 70% coverage, it's how we supply the extra airflow to the space. So again, we still need to remember we need to meet that 20 air changes minimum to that space. So for the additional airflow that's going into that zone, in an air curtain system, we supply it through a basically a perimeter slot or uh, a perimeter uh, hoard diffuser. In this application, you typically have about 30 to 40% of your airflow passing through a small laminar array over the table, just to make sure we're hitting that 70% requirement. And then the rest of that airflow is through these perimeter slots, which ends up being about 60 to 70%. The velocity range on these are typically between 25 to 45 CFM per linear foot. So ASH, or the ASHRAE standard currently doesn't have a specific velocity that you have to use for these, but based on practice and knowledge, 25 to 45 tends to be the recommended range. Again, we're gonna have those low level returns to exhaust the airflow out of the space. And if you look at the image on the bottom right hand side there, the design goal behind the system is to have laminar airflow directly over top of the table. And then these perimeter slots essentially create a, a curtain or a barrier around the operating space to try and prevent any contaminants that may be sitting inside that space from recirculating and getting back over top of the operating table. So in terms of return, the standard does require two low mounted exhaust grills in that space. Uh, typically four is what's recommended and most commonly used. These are typically located symmetrically in the center of the walls or in the four corners of the space. The standard does have a provision for an optional second set of mid to high level returns mounted on the wall. So these are typically sized around 500 feet per minute. Uh, that isn't a requirement of the standard. That's just a general requirement in order to keep your sound and pressure drop low for the airflow that's gonna be passing through these grills. So this is just uh, a cut explaining that. So it says it does have that exception that the low level returns can be supplemented with a mid to high placed wall return. Uh, the reason I had that highlighted is, is for a little while there, we were getting quite a few questions about 
having ceiling mounted returns, but the standard specifically states that the returns need to be mounted on the wall. So just a quick visual example so we can see what we're talking about here. We have a sample size room of 480 square feet, 10 foot ceiling. We can calculate the amount of airflow we need for the space using our air change rate calculation. So for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's your air change rate multiplied by your volume divided by 60. That will give us 160 CFM required for this space. We also see that our table size is six foot by two feet. We now need to make our primary supply diffuser array area. So now we have our eight foot by four foot zone. We know that only 30% can be non-diffusers, which means that 70% has to be supply diffusers. In this application, we can meet that with three two by four diffusers. We're limited between 25 to 35 CFM per square foot. So we're gonna get either 60 to 840 CFM out of those three diffusers. However, we remember from the previous slide that we have to meet our 20 air change rate requirement, and that was 1,600 CFM. So we're short quite a bit of CFM, so we're gonna have to add that into the space. In a laminar airflow system, we're essentially just gonna add in these additional laminar flow diffusers until we have enough airflow to meet that 1,600 CFM and our 20 air changes per hour. If this was a horde system, then instead of those three laminar flow diffusers, we would perhaps just add a perimeter air curtain around there. So that can depend a little bit on the size of the space, how much additional airflow you're gonna to need to meet your air change rate, as well as the how much coverage you need in order to meet your table coverage. One thing to keep in mind is that when we're looking at values for products in these type of spaces, is that sound values use ASHRAE 70 as its form to catalog it. So ASHRAE 70 has what we call room absorptions that are built into the system itself. So what that means is that we have, they assume there's gonna be, for example, carpeting, maybe acoustic tile in the ceiling, perhaps there would be um, things in there that can be absorbing your sound waves, so it's not gonna be as reflective. So they take 10 dB off of whatever the actual measured sound value is out of those diffusers. However, since this is an operating space, a lot of these are gonna have hard reflective surfaces, so we can't assume those dB abduction or deductions are going to apply. So we typically say uh, just to assume that there's gonna be, they're gonna sound about 10 NC higher than what's shown in the actual performance itself. The good news is, is most of these units are designed for very low NC values, typically uh, like 15 around or possibly even less. So adding in those extra 10 dB or 10 NC isn't really gonna cause too many sound concerns for the system unless you're choking off a large amount of airflow at a damper or something along those lines. So moving into some challenges that we might see that we may not have seen previously when we were designing these type of spaces. So some of the trends that we've noticed is that operating rooms tend to be getting larger. So what might have been a common 400 or 480 square foot operating room, now 600 is probably a lot more common in terms of an OR size. So there's typically a lot more equipment as well. So newer, more advanced technology has come out, new pieces of equipment and machinery. So we need to have space for that as well as these can generate higher loads in the space. And then hybrid rooms are also becoming very popular. So the combination of a surgery and an imaging space into one zone. And these have an additional set of requirements for them. So some of the challenges that these things bring is that it leads to very congested ceiling layouts, trying to fit all the different diffusers into the space as well as all the pieces of equipment. And that can lead to conge congested ceiling plenums as well. So making all your duct connections, making all your electrical connections, all the wiring, uh, conduit, everything along those lines, it can become very congested above the ceiling as well. So this slide here is just to kind of reflect on how changing the size of the OR can affect the amount of diffusers that we require for the space. So the first line is taking basically the example room that we did previously, our 480 square foot OR at 20 air changes per hour, 1600 CFM. So we were able to meet that with six diffusers in the space. Now, if we move to a 600 square foot room, again, maintaining our 20 air changes per hour, we now have a 2000 CFM requirement 
because our volume increased while air changes stayed the same, so we have to increase CFM. So now we have nine diffusers required to meet that. If, or perhaps we want to design slightly higher than the minimum at 25, or there's a specific procedure that has a higher air change requirement, maybe you go up to 25 air changes. So now we're at 2,500 CFM or 12 diffusers. As you can see, it keeps getting larger and larger, and then the amount of space in your ceiling that's getting taken up the diffusers keeps getting larger as well. Hybrid rooms, these can tend to be quite large, about maybe 850 to 1,000 square feet in size. Again, we still need that 20 air changes per hour. So we're looking at 3,400 CFM or maybe 15 diffusers. So it keeps getting uh, larger and larger is basically what we're trying to showcase here. Hybrid rooms, interventional radiology, catheterization labs, EP labs, these all have an additional uh, challenge in that they quite often will have unistrut and rails in the spaces as well. So these pieces of imaging equipment, they typically have to have the structural support from unistrut, and then they'll often have a rail or something that will allow them to move or facilitate movement of a C-arm. So this restricts where we can place diffusers in our layout, and then that can become a challenge in terms of our design as well. So this image here is just showing to us just how congested some of these spaces can get. Once you have your diffusers, your ceiling grid, uh, imaging equipment, equipment rails, unistrut, lighting, uh, light booms, sprinklers, med gas lines, security cameras, speakers, uh, there's quite a bit of equipment that's going into that ceiling. So that's that congestion that we're talking about. So it's nice to have or to know about some of the challenges, but what's even better is to know how we can handle them and some strategies. So one major shift is the type of ceiling that's being used in that space. So we need to maintain room pressure. We have to have that positive 0.01 inches uh, to meet our ASHRAE standard. And then in the past, this was typically done using what's called a monolithic ceiling. So a hard ceiling, uh, it prevented any type of air from bypassing through that ceiling space. FGI essentially had a requirement for that, but they did amend that to allow the use of what we call mechanical grid systems. So these would be prefabricated grid style systems and they're able to be used so long as they're either gasketed or caulked. So because we need to ensure we're maintaining that pressure seal. How this has helped us is that if you look at the image on the left hand side, the older style hard ceiling had to measure, cut and frame openings for every single penetration that happened into that ceiling. So every diffuser, every piece of lighting, uh, every equipment boom, access panel, it all required to be measured, cut, and framed. This took a lot of time for the contractors and the drywallers on site. And then now being able to do this, for example, with a grid style system, they only have to measure, cut, and frame one single large opening. The grid gets installed and then everything else could pretty much lay into that grid. So this cuts down on installation time quite substantially uh, in these type of applications. And it could also cut down on the amount of ceiling space. Because we can see on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of gap between each one of our penetrations. And that's just to make room for the framing and support. Because the grid system itself is going to be supported typically from hanger wire or gripple wire, uh, we could every put everything tighter together, which takes up less space as well as gives a more aesthetic look. These systems can come either individual pieces of T or they can come as prefabricated sections as we see here. So this is again, trying to reduce the amount of installation time on site, as opposed to having to build out your whole ceiling, you're gonna have prefabricated sections that are just gonna fasten together on site to again, cut down on that installation time. Access above the ceiling is also important for any type of maintenance work that you're gonna be doing in that space. Before we had to designate and specify specific access doors into that zone. Now with a lot of these newer systems, we can use basically what we have, what we call a patented access clip. So it allows any panel in your ceiling to be used as an access panel. So you don't need to specify a specific access panel. Anywhere that is a panel in your space can be used to gain access above the ceiling. Here's just a picture of what those look like installed into a space. So we can see the image is uh, very, very clean in terms of its look. The one on the right hand side here has the diffusers installed, but still is waiting to install the lighting perimeter and the equipment booms along the outside of that. But it shows how neat and how tight everything can get together in that space. 
So if we want to take this a step further, especially if we look back at that image that we just saw, there's quite a bit of diffusers installed in that right-hand image, and then we would have to duct each one of these diffusers individually. So what we've done is we've come up with what's called a common plenum design system, which essentially allows the air to transfer from one diffuser to the next without having its own individual duct connection. So the benefit of that is, as you can see on here, we're able to reduce the number of inlet connections quite substantially. So this can cut down not only on pressure drop because we have less duct run in the ceiling, it can also reduce height as well because we can do side inlet connections as you can see. So as opposed to having to have a duct branch and then a drop from that branch into your diffuser, we can come in right off of the main branch with a larger sized inlet connection that air feeds into the plenum system and then it has uh, pressurization plates inside of it. So essentially we have either dampering plates or filters inside there, stuff that's going to cause back pressure that forces the airflow to equalize inside the system until it's built up enough pressure to pass through uh, that back pressure generation and then it'll distribute into the space. And in doing this, it equalizes probably about 85% of the airflow without any balancing at all. And then each one of the diffusers do have a manual adjustment so you can fine tune it to ensure you're getting equalized airflow out of all of the different uh, modules in your system. Another benefit of these common plenum style systems is that they can be very, or they can be a little bit easier to clean. You can think if you have a grid system or a hard ceiling with a plaster frame, there's always gonna be an elevation difference between the diffuser and the grid itself. And then that can sometimes make it a little more challenging because you have to worry about getting in all the crevices. With a common plenum system, because it ends up being a flush face, it can make it a little bit easier to wipe down in deca decontamination. So we talked about hybrid causing additional challenges in terms of location of diffusers and that's mainly because as you can see the unistrut and rails in the system prevent us from locating diffusers where we would typically want to place them. So you can see the double solid vertical lines here would represent the unistrut in the space and then where that dark blue light gray uh, horizontal lines is where the ceiling level rails would be. So this is important to keep in mind because Oftentimes, those rails may not be represented on the mechanical plan. And then because of that, we may end up having, you may line up diffusers vertically in those spaces between those struts, but then the rail can end up getting installed below those diffusers, and that would prevent us from opening them and gaining access for that internal cleaning that we talked about previously. So quite often, custom sized diffusers are required for these type of spaces in order to maximize the amount of coverage we're getting to meet that 70% requirement while still being able to provide enough airflow to the space and fit in between the restrictions of the unistruts and the rails. So just an example of what we want to try and avoid, we don't want to have those ceiling level rails installed directly over top of the faces of the diffusers that prevent us from gaining access to the interior. So in order to complete a seal, if we do have these unistruts installed into our spaces, we can provide what's called the closure strip to those. So that allows it to seal that unistrut off from the ceiling plenum so you don't have air bypass between the interstitial space and your operating zone. And it also provides an aesthetic finish to it so that from the room side, everything looks like uh, consistent. This is just to show that these rooms can get fairly complex. So the spacing between the unistruts, the spacing between the rails isn't always consistent. So you're probably not going to be able to fit standard size diffusers in between those. And this is where those custom size diffusers uh, really show or really shine and allow you to meet your ASHRAE requirements. So that leads us into the final evolution, which is the fully integrated OR system. So at price, we, our fully integrated system is the Allstreet system. There are other options for fully integrated systems as well. But essentially, a fully integrated system, you're now combining your lighting into your HVAC system as well. So as opposed to just supplying the air side of it, then having your lighting be separate, now your lighting is getting combined into that, so you're getting everything all in one. So we can see here on the image on the top hand side uh, what benefit that would provide. We can see the amount of space that's taken up in this 
location is drastically reduced. So as opposed to having your diffuser array and then a light ring perimeter, with those two combined, it frees up a lot of that ceiling space to help alleviate that congestion that we were talking about previously. Another main benefit of this style of system is that we can use it to get lighting directly over top of the table. So that's where we ideally want to have our lighting. That's where people are going to be working. But typically your lights were relegated to the perimeter because you had to have the diffusers over top of the table to meet ASHRAE. Now with them combined, we're still meeting ASHRAE, but we're also getting lighting directly over top of the table. So this helps to eliminate shadows and improve visibility in the space. So I just have a quick video here showing the smoke pattern of the diffusers. So we can see that even though the system is providing lighting, it's also providing airflow to the space as well. All the systems are CFD verified. So we have done several or quite a bit of testing into it. And we can also do CFD analysis for job specific sites as well. So just an example of that, we had one where they were looking at sources of contamination in their OR. And they wanted to see if any of those contaminations would recirculate back over top of the operating room table. And then we showed that using the ultra suite, none of that contamination ended up recirculating back over top of the OR table. Using the ultra suite, it's able to take advantage of all the benefits that we talked about for those common plenum systems. So we still have that low profile. We can get down to 12 inches in height. It still has that reduced inlet connection as well as the side inlet availability to connect into that system itself. We can use these with hybrid style spaces as well. So they can be spaced uh, between the unistrut. So even though in a general layout, the units would end up butting up end to end, if there is unistrut, we can space it out and then use a manifolded connection on the back side of it to still allow that air to pass between each one of the modules. So with these systems, they're designed to meet 300 foot candles at the operating room table. Uh, you can, we do provide photometric IES files. So essentially you can take these files, plug them into a lighting software, and that'll give you light levels within the space. We also have a full design team available. So if you don't have access to any of this type of software, we can provide you the light levels of what a system layout would look like, given we have the layout of your space. The lighting itself is very high profile or um, high quality. So it is rated for L80 over 60,000. Essentially that means it'll maintain greater than 80% of its original brightness for over 60,000 hours of operation. It's also IP67 rated, which makes it impervious to both dust and liquids. So that's very beneficial when we're talking about cleaning. We don't have to worry about any of the cleaning solutions getting inside damaging the lighting because it's IP67 rated. We also have what are called remote mounted driver cabinets. So essentially most lighting systems will have the drivers on the backside of the light itself. And in most applications, that's fine. However, with an operating space, if you wanna do any type of maintenance to those, you're gonna to have to go up into your ceiling. And then when you do that, you create a pathway for contaminants between the plenum and the OR. So that means you're gonna to have to re-sterilize the entire operating suite after you've opened up those access panels. So what we were able to do is we're able to mount these drivers actually outside the OR, either in an equipment closet or somewhere, or an equipment corridor. And then it allows maintenance to be done without actually disrupting what's going on in the operating space. So just a quick schematic of what that might look like. You have the operating room with the ultra system installed over top of it. And then you have low voltage connections between the remote driver cabinet and the ultra suite system itself. And then that can be installed in an equipment closet or corridor, which allows them to do maintenance without disrupting what's happening in the OR space. So with the systems themselves, you wanna make sure you have good 
light in the space. So it has to have very high efficiency lighting and high performance lighting. So the re how we rate those are color rendering index or CRI. Essentially, if you're outside, you're looking at something in a nice sunlight, that's a CRI of 100. And then you want to get as close to 100 as possible to represent what things would look like in true daylight. So for operating spaces, typically they recommend 85 plus. Uh, we do offer 90 CRI rating for our lighting in these spaces, so you can get that high quality lighting. There are also different selectable color temperatures, so a range between 2,500 and 6,100. Your two most common ones will be 5,100 Kelvin and about 4,300 Kelvin. That's typically what represent either daylight or cool fluorescent white, but we do offer the whole range if there are existing lights in a retrofit application, for example, and you wanna match the color skew, then we can select different color temperatures to do that. So here I just have a quick video on the installation of the system so you can see how it all comes together. So here we can see just installing some of the supports, which is just threaded rod. You have those prefabricated sections that we talked about, which allows quicker installation because you're just installing two sections and fastening together. Reduction on our inlet connections, just two large inlet connections to the side. To doing the low voltage wiring uh, for the drivers, installing the dampers for airflow balancing, ensuring we're getting equalized airflow out of all the modules, and then installing the faces. So we can see with a two-person team how long it took to get a system fully installed, and it was just over nine hours. In a standard style system, you might be looking at a full week to get a system installed. So we can see quite a bit of a reduction in terms of installation time. So just to finish off on the OR section, just a couple job site photos so you can see what it looks like on an actual job site. So here we can see, this is a little bit of a smaller procedure room, so the laminar array wasn't very large, but we have the ultrasound system installed over top of the table, uh, equipment boom, and then a door for access on the other side of there. And then looking at it when it's fully installed, it cleans up a lot of that ceiling space. The Lighting particularly would have been relegated, so we would have had to push the med gas lines out, we would have had to push the sprinklers out, the access panels out. Uh, it would have created a lot more congestion trying to locate everything, but having them combined allowed us to free us free that up and then have uh, availability of where we want to locate those other pieces of equipment. Working with hybrid style rooms, so this one is a hybrid imaging style space. So the configuration doesn't necessarily need to be rectangular like we saw in the other images. It's very customizable, very flexible in terms of its application. And these are done on a job by job basis. So they're designed specifically to meet the needs of each individual OR. A larger one using a combination of indigo lighting integration into the system. And then finally, just a, a, a really nice aesthetic picture here, uh, showing a nice clean ceiling. And then this one is a plastic surgery clinic. Uh, as you can tell, it's probably not a typical OR, just due to the large windows installed in the space. Hey, Chris, uh, real yep. quick before we move on, there's just a few questions here relative to the Ultra Suite that I'd like to address. Uh, sure. The first of which, um, does the use of UltraSuite preclude the use of terminal mounted filtration? So you can use filters, so that secondary filter bank requirement, uh, you can install filters directly into the UltraSuite. So you can do that filtration from the room side with the UltraSuite as well. So you wouldn't necessarily need it on the terminal unit after the, the wet coil or fan, because you can have it on the terminal side with the UltraSuite. Perfect. Yeah, I think the question was relative to the, the knife edge and the HEPA filtration right at the diffuser face. And we can include that as part of the ultra suite. Um, and then the other one was, can you build the Unistrut in the plenum of the ultra suite? So typically what we do is we design around where the Unistrut would go in the system. So we have done applications where we've had the Unistrut sent to us and then we've 
factory assembled it with our system and then sent it out. But we we wouldn't do the actual structural calculations of where it's going to go into the space. We would just design our system around where the locations that it needs to be based on the equipment manufacturer drawing for the equipment booms in that zone. Okay, great. Thanks, Chris. Continue. Not a problem. All right, so now that we've covered the operating room spaces, we'll finish off with talking about some ancillary or auxiliary spaces, such as our patient rooms, isolation rooms, uh, and what we call the pandemic ready patient spaces. So a patient room has a few requirements, not as strict as what we just went over through the operating space, but it does have a minimum of four total air changes for the space. Two of those need to be outdoor air. There's no pressure relationship required for these zones. The only spot is the bathroom because the bathroom has to be negative pressured relative to the actual patient space itself. There's no recirculation or no restrictions on recirculation of airflow, so we're allowed to recirculate airflow in that space without any issues. And we have a maximum relative humidity of 60% with a typical room temp between 70 and 75 Fahrenheit. So here's what a layout might look like using group A or group E diffusers. Again, those groups that we talked about, group E was ceiling mounted downward projection, and then group A is ceiling mounted horizontal projection. So this is basically frees up any of the diffusers that you would typically use for a mixing style system to be used in these type of spaces. So these are typically mounted the supply side and the ceiling. Uh, quite often you're just gonna be locating that to get equal coverage of your entire space. Then your returns can be mounted depending on the construction of the building, either in the ceiling or in the sidewall. A group D diffuser is essentially a displacement style diffuser. And then these, in this location, you're gonna mount that diffuser typically near your patient bed, because the difference with this style of system is that you're designing it in order to have stratification in your space. So you're gonna want your cooler temperatures, uh, clean air down in the occupied zone. And then as it heats up and rises, it's gonna pull the contaminants with it out of the space and then towards high level returns that are gonna be mounted in the ceiling. So with that in mind, we'll move into the isolation rooms, which now have a few more extra restrictions. So here we do have a filtration requirement of our airflow entering the space. So whether it's an AII, which is an airborne infectious isolation room or a PE protective environment room, we can see that the AII room has the same requirements as an operating space. It has to have two filters, your first one with a MERV, second, MERV 7 and your second downstream has to be MERV 14. The PE rooms have a slightly higher requirement with your secondary filter bank needing to be HEPA. So with an airborne infectious isolation room, this is the type of room that we're designing to protect the staff or visitors from a contagious patient. So this is typically uh, if the patient has a perhaps maybe tuberculosis or some sort of airborne transmissible uh, contaminant then we wanna put them into an airborne infectious isolation room to try and prevent any of the doctors or nursing staff from contracting what the patient has. So in this location, we wanna install our supply diffusers closer to the entranceway into the space, so by the entrance door. And then we wanna have the return diffusers by the patient bed, by the low by the patient head, or directly above the patient if there's no room to locate it there. In this application, we're gonna to have to have a, uh, what we call, uh, the pathway of their airflow to be from like clean to dirty from that entrance towards the patient. So that way people entering the space are breathing that clean air first, and then it's gonna be passing over the patient and then directly towards the return. So these have a minimum of 12 air changes per hour in the space. So we wanna increase the amount of air circulation happening in that space. So you don't build up concentration uh, of the contaminants as that patient exhales. We still need a minimum of two outdoor airs into that zone and these spaces need to be negatively pressured relative to the rest of the hospital. So this is to ensure that any of the contaminants don't spread into adjacent zones. So we wanna make sure everything is negatively pressured into that space. Exhaust from these spaces needs to be directed directly outdoors. So we're not gonna be recirculating airflow for these spaces, unless of course we're using HEPA filtration. So we remember that the standard here required uh, MER 14. If we do use HEPA filtration, then we are able to do recirculation. So some specific requirements on the exhaust side, uh, because again, these 
patients have these additional contagions, uh, the exhaust side obviously is going to be a little stricter. So all exhaust ductwork must be under negative pressure, again, to prevent any type of uh, leakage of that airflow infiltration into other zones. Exhaust shall additionally be arranged to discharge to the atmosphere in a vertical direction and at least 10 feet above adjoining roof level. And exhaust shall be located not less than 25 feet horizontally from outdoor air intakes, openable windows and doors, and areas that are normally accessible to the public. So these two points here are referring to, we don't want people that are on the roof working on maintenance equipment or someone that might be outside a window to be able to breathe in the exhaust from this room. So that's just saying that they want that discharge 10 feet above the roof level or 25 feet out horizontally. We just don't want anyone breathing in this air secondhand. So it does say that all air from the airborne infectious isolation room shall be exhausted directly to the outdoors, but then it does mention that rooms that are retrofitted from standard patient spaces and which is impractical to exhaust directly outdoors may be provided with recirculated air from the room's exhaust on the condition that it first passes through a HEPA filter. So that additional level of filtration by stepping it up to that HEPA filter allows us to do that recirculation. Protective environments, on the other hand, are essentially designed the inverse of the airborne infectious isolation room. So this is for a patient that is immunocompromised, so they're more susceptible to picking up viruses or bacteria in the space. So here we wanna have our clean air now directly over top of our patient first, and then have the return closer to the entrance to the space. Here it does require group E non-aspirating, so that requires laminar airflow, and it should be located again above that patient bed. Because the patient doesn't have any additional contagions, we're not worried about the doctors or nursing staff picking up what the patient has. We're just more concerned about the patient catching uh, something from the staff or visitors entering the space. So again, we have a 12 air change per hour requirement with two of which being outdoor air. This room is now positively pressured so we don't want any contaminants from any adjacent spaces infiltrating into our zones. So we want to make sure we're maintaining positive pressure. Uh, it does say that recirculation HEPAs shall be permitted to increase equivalent room air changes per hour, and that protective environment rooms can be used as a standard patient room if we don't have anyone that requires that specific care. So instead of keeping the room empty, you can put a standard patient in there until someone comes in that requires the protective environment isolation space. So now what if we run into a space where our patient is both contagious as well as highly susceptible to further infection? We can't put them in an airborne infectious isolation room because it's gonna be negatively pressured, it's gonna be pulling in uh, all that air from outside zones. And we can't put them in a PEE room because then it's gonna be positively pressured as we pushing what he's exhaling out into other spaces. So what we have to do is we have to add an anteroom to the design. So this anteroom essentially creates a barrier between adjacent corridor, the rest of the space, as well as the actual patient room itself. So your anteroom is typically positively pressured relative to both the corridor and the actual patient room. So your airflow isn't gonna cross paths between the two of them. So we can keep them separated while still having a negative pressure room for our patient so that he's not gonna be exhaling those contaminants into adjacent zones. Final thing we'll touch on today is what we call the pandemic ready patient rooms. So this currently isn't a requirement under any of the codes, but just after all the recent things that have happened with COVID and then the shortage of having negative pressure isolation spaces, uh, we thought it would be pertinent to be able to have designs that can switch between being a standard patient room into a negative isolation room at essentially the push of a button. So there's a few different layouts that we can do in order to do this. So the first one is what we call a retrofit layout application. This would be for an existing building. Essentially what we would provide is a fan filter unit for this application that would have a dual exhaust to it. So essentially half of your air would get recirculated to the space and the other half of it would get exhausted out of the building. So essentially we are gonna have our clean supply air coming in through our typical VAV system. It's gonna be supplying our fresh air to the space in standard patient operation mode. If we were to have to switch it to this negative pressure isolation zone, depending on if we're trying to go into true airborne infectious isolation or just negative pressure isolation, we can control that to kick on our fan filter unit. That's gonna 
exhaust additional airflow from the space, which is going to create that negative pressure in the space. It's going to pass it through a HEPA filter. That HEPA filter is going to recirculate some of that airflow to the zone, again, because we want to maintain a certain pressure relationship in that space. And then the rest of the air is going to be exhausted directly outside the building. So we would have to have something on our control side in order to control uh, whether the air is going to be exhausted out of the existing return versus the exhaust coming out of the fan filter unit. But that can be done very simply with uh, some logic and control devices. So this allows us to have that room in regular patient mode, switch it to this isolation style state, and then it'll immediately switch it to negative pressure, recirculate airflow that's required, and exhaust air as opposed to returning it to your regular air handling system. This is what we call uh, the base layout or perhaps a, a new construction style layout. The main difference between this one and the one we just previously looked at is there's slightly less uh, pieces of equipment in there because we can design the fan filter unit to integrate with the existing supply diffuser side. So we can see in the center where it's circled uh, with the purple and blue arrows, you're gonna have your supply airflow would get fed into that diffuser. And then when the fan filter unit kicks on, instead of having it branch off into uh, an additional supply diffuser, we could also feed that air to that same diffuser with a mixing box. And then this would allow us to uh, eliminate some of the diffusers that would be re typically required into this style of space. We would also be able to have like our regular return and our exhaust return that can be controlled via a switch in the zone. The final layout we call referred to it as the quote unquote premium layout. And then essentially this is a newer product that's designed specifically for this application. So this is what we call our isolation fan filter unit. And then in this one, it has a built in uh, supply side to it as well as the exhaust return side. So again, another reduction in the amount of actual diffusers required into that space. So we can still provide that clean, fresh airflow to the space, as well as the recirculated filtered airflow to the space to meet air change rate and be able to switch between returning and exhausting our airflow, depending on what style of environment we are in. So the main benefit we see from all three of these applications is it allows you to be future proof or future ready. So if you do ever run into an issue where, where there's suddenly a large requirement for these type of negative pressure spaces, we can convert some of these standard spaces directly into these uh, negative pressure or isolation spaces without having to reach out, purchase new equipment. We can do that all instantaneously at the click of a button or through your control system. So that brings me to the end of the presentation. Uh, was there any other questions that uh, I didn't answer, any questions on this section that we didn't get through? Yeah, Chris, there was uh, there was one other question. Um, <clears throat> Traditionally, has blocking the low return been a problem by staff uh, with furniture and such, or are they well-versed in being aware of the HVAC needs? So that's probably more like a case by case basis. I personally haven't had a lot of people bring that up to me as a concern. Um, typically you, in these type of environments, you'd think that they'd have to locate their pieces of equipment and furniture to allow that air to circulate properly uh, and exhaust properly from the space. Uh, yeah, I can't say for sure either way, but I haven't had that brought up to me as an issue. Okay, great. Um, and then uh, next one, uh, are the graphic panels used in the presentation going to be available for download? Um, we are going to be sharing a PDF version of this presentation. Uh, if there's anything specific that you'd like more information on, just let us know. Uh, this presentation will also be available on uh, Buckley's YouTube channel as well. Um, next one, uh, would you please explain the equalization balance of the plenum system again? Yeah, not a problem. So essentially about 85% of that system gets balanced on its own. And then how it does that is that we limit the velocity of the airflow that's going to be entering the common plenum system, typically to about 500 to 800 feet per minute. So that's typically the range for a pressurized plenum design. And then inside each of the units, they're gonna have a baffling system. So there's gonna be something in there that's creating back pressure. 
And then there's also the possibility of having HEPA filters in there as well. So as our airflow enters into the common plenum, it's going to be traveling at this lower velocity. So it's going to want to seek out openings within that plenum. And then it's going to travel into that plenum portion. And it's not going to have enough essentially potential energy to pass through the back pressure that's created by the filters, uh, by the dampers, and then by that baffling plate. So once the air has nowhere else to go, no more open spots in that plenum, as more air is getting pushed into the system, it's going to start to build up in pressure. And then as it does that, it's going to build up and create enough energy that it's going to be able to push through the back pressure that's generated and then into the space. So this forces that air to essentially be everywhere equalized in that plenum before it starts coming out into your operating space. So that's how 85% of that is done on its own. And then the last 15% is done basically with each, what we call equalization baffles. So on the face of each one of the units, there is a sliding aperture plate. It's essentially two plates that are lined up on top of each other, and they have holes that, as you move the plate, will adjust the size of that opening of the hole. And you can use that to control how much airflow is coming out of each individual module to ensure that you're getting that equalized airflow across the entire system. Great. Thanks, Chris. I think that was it for questions. Um, in closing, I'd just like to, again, thank everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Um, you know, if you have any further questions, uh, if you have people on your team that you think will benefit from this presentation and you'd like to recommend it to them, we are offering another session on Thursday of this week at noon. Uh, please let them know that that's available if you think they'll be interested. Um, if you have any projects that you may be looking to implement some of this technology on and you would like some engineering support, you want to engage the Buckley team, you want to engage Price and, uh, and you know, get our opinion on things, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. If you don't know who your contact is at Buckley, please uh, reach out to me, reach out to Sherry Malone in our office. We'll get you pointed in the right direction. Uh, again, this is eligible for PDH credits. So for those of you who do need that, please let us know. Um, you, can, you can chase that down with Sherry Malone. Uh, I'll also be sending up uh, a follow-up email. You can respond to that to let us know. Uh, and I think that's about it. So thank you again for everyone involved in putting this together. Thank you for those of you that joined and thank you, Chris. Not a problem. Thanks everybody.